Good afternoon and welcome once again to a time of worship before our holy God. What a privilege indeed that is. Before we begin worship, we'll sing our pre-service song, number 105C, O praise the Lord, His deeds make known. We remain seated to sing number 105C. As we come into the presence of our God, once again, let's go before him now in a time of silent prayer. 
asking that he would remove all distractions from us, that he would work in the thoughts of our hearts and the work of our minds this afternoon as we worship him. Let's go before him in prayer. Indeed, O Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please rise as we're called to worship. This afternoon, our God calls us to worship with the words of 2 Samuel 22, verses 50 and 51. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forevermore. As we enter into a God's presence, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship our God in songs. We turn to number 239, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Number 239 will remain standing as we sing.
praise together the God of grace as we confess our faith in him using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on page 851 in the back of the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. So, beloved people of God, I ask you this day, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue our study in the Heidelberg Catechism, we come one final time this time around to Lord's Day 12 and the kingship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his reign and rule over all things, the hope that that brings us. So our wisdom reading this afternoon will be from Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10, this is page 748 in the Pew Bibles. Daniel 10, beginning at verse 1. Beloved, hear the word of your God. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was great conflict, a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ephaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face with the, like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like, like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who, who were with me did not see the vision. But a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell to my face, on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words." The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with you. I was left there with the king, kings of Persia, and I came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for the days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one, one in the likeness of children, the children of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. 
Then he said, Do you know why I've come to you? But now I return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the, great, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And beloved, as we come to the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps this sounds like a bit of an odd passage to read as we consider the work of the Lord Jesus, as we consider his reign and rule over all. But as we'll see, there is much more going on in reality than what we see with our eyes. Here, Daniel speaks of the princes of Persia. He speaks of Greece. And what does he associate with these things? Well, much more than what meets the eye. There's a whole lot more going on here than mere geopolitical events. There is spiritual warfare happening here. Christ himself involved, the great king. His angels, as we read here, Michael involved. Helping one angel out as he goes to another man to help him understand what is happening. No, if we don't take into account that there is much more going on than what meets our physical eyes, we will fail to truly understand the beauty, the promise, and the glory of what our Savior has done and is doing for you and for me. He reigns over all things, and that is a great comfort to us because he reigns over more than just this physical realm here. He reigns over the spiritual realm, over all of it. None of these things are outside of his care. None of them are outside of his work in his hand. He is sovereign over all. Satan, even though he intends to accuse us and to destroy us, as we'll see, he's been thrown down. The accuser can accuse us no more. Perhaps, as we saw this morning, he can thrash around in his death throes, trying to strike at us and to destroy us. He will not be successful because our king reigns. Our king has the victory. Our king owns us, saves us, and calls us then to strive with him, not to strive to get our salvation. He's won that battle for us. But because he has won, he calls us to strive against the sin in our own lives, against the devil and all his schemes, knowing that the victory has been won. Thanks be to God. Let's respond with the words of Psalm 47a. We'll remain seated to sing 47a. Oh, clap your hands.
Let's go in prayer as a congregation to that one who is exalted, the great Lord, our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we confess back to you the very words of the psalmist, those inspired words that you have given us. O oh Lord, praise you, our Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise our Lord in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. You gave a decree, O Lord, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the heaven, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings, kings of the earth and all peoples. Princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. Your name, O Lord, is glorious. Your majesty is above the earth and heaven. O Lord, you have raised a horn for your people. Praise for all, from all of your saints. O Lord, we seek to praise you this day. We seek to praise you with the words of our songs as we sing your glorious praise. As we worship you, Father, not just with the words of our mouths, but in the meditations of our hearts. Oh, Father, take these captive as well. May the thoughts that we have, the meditations, may the words that we speak be praise of your name. Oh, Lord, may, be, may the actions of our hands be worship to your name. As we find ourselves in Christ, united to him, saved by him, given his righteousness alone, atoned by his blood, atoned for by his blood alone. O oh Lord, then send us forth, brimming with joy and gratitude at our glorious salvation. Indeed, as we confess in our catechism, may we strive against Satan and all his works. O oh Lord, open our eyes to see the ways in which Satan has rooted himself into our hearts and our minds and our lives, into our actions. By your Spirit, may we root him out. May we chase him away. May we flee from him and his temptations. And, O oh Lord, as we draw close to you, God, draw close to us. As we flee from Satan, may he flee from us. For indeed, O oh Lord, his days are numbered. His strength is limited. That final blow has been struck upon his head. The heel of the Savior has crushed him. So even as we see his actions so clearly throughout this world, so clearly at this doorstep of our own hearts, O oh Lord, we are those who are filled with great confidence that his time will be ended soon. That all that we have and all that we need is found under the reign of our gracious and glorious King, Jesus Christ himself. The accuser has been cast down from heaven. He can no longer accuse us, for ours is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his righteous robes. Ours is the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. The devil has nothing, the accuser has nothing that he can accuse us with. For our Lord Jesus Christ said upon the cross, it is finished. And indeed, O Lord, it is and always will be. So let us strive against him. Let us strive in our own families, O Lord, that we may seek to raise godly children who, who not only know the history and the glory of the drama of redemption, all that you have done, but who know what that means for their lives, that they are not their own, that they've been bought at a price, that the Holy Spirit now lives in them, that, that they may from now on live to serve him. And O Lord, as we enter into a, another week of work, whether it be in the home, in the field, or in the shop, in the office, O Lord, wherever it may be, even if it's in the classroom, this too, O Lord, is work that you call us to. May we do these things as those who do them unto you, because you have made us to reign with you and to rule with you. And so even now, as we await that great and glorious day when our Savior comes to, to make heaven and earth one and to wipe the tears from our eyes, 
even now you have given us work to do, callings to go about. May we do them cheerfully. May we do them as those who have a glorious hope for a glorious future. But Lord, even in this time between the times, there is much brokenness and suffering. As we bring before you those who have deep wounds within their hearts and within their souls, some which are able to share with each other and we can bear those burdens. Others, Lord, which are known only unto you. And we're promised that you will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. We're promised that your rod and your staff, they will comfort us. We're promised that you will prepare a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. We think, too, Lord, of our synod meeting this week for the United Reformed Churches in North America. Oh, Father, we ask that you would be with Alder Vandenbrink as he travels with his wife to this occasion. We ask that you would grant them safe travel. We ask that you would be with all the delegates as they gather to discuss matters of the church. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be faithful to your promise to build your church up. May this be a time of refreshment, a time of invigoration for the church. May all things be done decently and in good order. May they be done in a way that glorifies you, in a way that testifies to the nations that Jesus Christ is Lord. We ask that you would grant also uh, your tender mercies to the Ram Kassoon family and to the Schroeder family this day. Oh Lord, we've received word that uh, a friend of the church, Miss Debbie Schroeders, was taken to the hospital this morning during her, her time of worship. And Father, we don't know all the details right now, but you do. We ask that you would be near to Debbie, be near to her husband and children, be near to Reverend Ram Kassoon and Doris as they watch a, a daughter struggle. Father, watch over them. We ask that you would grant doctors wisdom as they tend to Debbie's needs. We ask that you would provide comfort for the family, that peace that passes all understanding. O oh Lord, we look above the hills and we see you, the one who will not let our foot slip. We think too this day, O oh Lord, of Adriana, the daughter of John and Jolene Heisman. O oh Father, they have come through also through a difficult week. Adriana having another episode and doctors not being clear on how to manage her case and how to treat her. And Lord, the, the fear and frustration that a family endures as they watch a child suffer and, and, the medical fee, and the, those in the medical practice not knowing what to do. Oh Lord, we ask that you would grant wisdom, that you would lead and guide the hands and the minds and thoughts of the doctors, that you would be near to Adriana and to Rob, be close to the children, O Lord, grant especially peace to John and Jolene. Be with their hearts. Guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as you are faithful to do. O Lord, we bring this family before you and place them in your very capable hands. And O Lord, as we open your word, we ask that we would see your victory in light of all our sufferings and sorrows. We have seen what you can do. O Lord, we know what you have done. We know what you do today. And Father, we have a good hope and a great confidence for what you will accomplish in the future. And so we rest our hands and our minds in our Savior Jesus. We ask that you would give us your spirit as we open your word, that he would show us a Savior, that he would fill our hearts with joy and gratitude, that we would seek to follow after him. O Lord, we ask these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Before we go to the word, we'll sing a song of preparation. Turning to number 110A, we'll stand if you're able to sing number 110A, The Lord Said to My Lord.
we have studied the threefold office of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have come from prophet to priest today, now we come to king. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, we'll read the chapter in its entirety. Our text will be uh, verses uh, 7 through 12. This is page 1034 in the Pew Bibles. I encourage you to open there and to follow along with me. Beloved people of God, hear now the word of our God. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child who, was to, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But a child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a, pla a place prepared by God in which she was to be nourished 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they have loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. We also look at Lord's Day 12 one final time. This is page 213. Page 213 in the Forms and Prayers book. Lord, say 12, question and answer 31, one last time. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher, who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance, our only high priest, who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually intercedes for us before the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the deliverance he has won for us. And over the page to question and answer 32. But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with the free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. Our catechism lesson for the day. Beloved people of God, is spiritual warfare a real thing? Does it happen today? Are there really demons and devils, angels out there fighting? Well, where I come from in the States, the most recent data, and this is July of 2022, this year, beloved, a poll was done that says a dismal 20% of Americans, 20% of Americans believe the Bible to be, quote, 
the literal word of God. That's down from 24% in the year 2017. And then, if you take more numbers from this poll, there's a a mushy middle 49% who say that, yes, well, the Bible may be the word of God. They, They don't deny it. But it's really not to be taken literally. And we could tease that out, what literally means, and the different interpretations of that. But there's a mushy 49% who will even admit, yes, the word of God, but they really don't know what to do with it. They, quite frankly, probably don't want to know what to do with it. 29% of Americans say that the Bible is merely a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man, end quote. I imagine the numbers here are the same, if not worse, in Canada, wouldn't you? Now imagine those numbers, take them in your mind and imagine how many people actually believe in the spiritual realm. Yeah, I believe in God, but what about angels, demons, devil, Satan himself, the accuser? Imagine what those numbers must look like. We don't have them, but I can pretty much guarantee you they're going to be heartbreaking if we could see them. Beloved, spiritual warfare, enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is a very real thing. It's happening now. As we'll see and as we No, I pray the definitive blow in that battle was won at the cross of Calvary. But these things are still going on all around us. And beloved, even in our own hearts and lives and minds, our own family, our own church, everywhere around us. Remember what happened when Peter was with the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus had to take him aside one time and say, Peter, Satan has decided he would like to sieve you, to take you, to have you for his own, but I will not allow it. Satan, the devil, spiritual warfare is a very real thing. We're engaged in it, but our king, how do we face this? It's because our king, he has won the greatest victory of all time. He leads us today. We rest in him. We follow after him. You don't fight that ultimate battle that was won at Calvary and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place. But we're involved in the conflict that has ensued afterwards because Satan knows his days are numbered. He's doing everything he can. The serpent, the accuser, he thrashes around in his death throes. He can be really nasty. He is extremely devious. To us, maybe he can even seem powerful. But compared to our king, everything that he throws at us, we can endure. Because a life has been stamped out of him, his time, as I said, is limited. His days are numbered. We can face everything thrown at us because we rejoice. We have hope because we've seen Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, cast him down. And so therefore, we can strive with a free conscience, as the catechism says. We can strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil because afterwards we're going to reign with him. So our theme as we consider this text this day will be this. We rejoice to see King Jesus throw down the accuser. We rejoice to see King Jesus throw down the accuser. We'll take this up under three points. The authority of the king, the suffering of his people, and the rejoicing at his victory. The authority of the king, the suffering of his people, and rejoicing at his victory. And so the authority is where we begin this afternoon. And now one day, I do admit, I hope to preach through the book of Revelation. I strongly desire that. And when I do, we will 
get our hands very much deeper into all the, the symbolism and the numbers and the characters in these texts. But today we're going to focus on the key characters in this text, in Revelation 12. Since our scope today is limited to the joy that we have in watching Satan cast down. As we consider the joy of Christ's reign and rule. And so let's think about that for a moment. Let's first talk about kingship. Kingship, what does it mean? Why is kingship important? Why do we as believers even care about it? So what if Jesus is king? So what if he's reigning and ruling right now? So what if I'm called to follow after him? What does it even look like? Children, what is a king? We read about them in our Bible stories. We read about them and hear about them in fairy tales. Every good story seems to have a king in it. What is a king? What does a king do? Well, a king has two things. He has a domain. He has land that he has control of, borders, a kingdom. And then he also has a people who inhabit those borders. A domain that he rules over with people in it, people he oversees, people he takes care of. A king has a kingdom, and he has people in that kingdom. And so what do we learn from our text and even our wisdom reading this afternoon? Especially as it comes to the reality of God's kingdom, God's domain. Well, beloved, it consists of much more than just this earth itself. God's kingdom is larger than every square inch of this earth. It consists of both heaven and earth and everything in between. So why bring Daniel 10 into the mix today? Well, because we see in Daniel 10 and in Revelation 12 that the actions that take place in heaven and on earth very much correspond to each other. There's an integral relation with what happens in heaven to what happens on earth. In Daniel 10, the happenings in Persia and Greece, they weren't just geopolitical events happening randomly. There's spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes, we saw. They're a result of spiritual warfare. The devil's challenging the authority of Christ as king over all. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I must go out hunting for a demon or an angel out of under every rock or behind every tree. It doesn't work like that. But it's important that we understand that what we see with our eyes here on earth is merely half of the story. Satan and the forces of darkness are very much active. They're very much at play in this world. One with the import appearance of a man comes to Daniel, we read. He touches him. He says, do you know why I've come to you? This is Daniel 10 that we read earlier, verses 20 and 21. Do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return and fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you that what is inscribed in the book of truth, there is no one who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Angels and demons affecting the political actions of kings and princes. Well, King Jesus sends his own angels into the fray. And this is nothing less than the promise of Genesis 15 continuing to play out. And by now, especially little ones, I hope that Genesis 15 is wrapped into your mind. We come to it often, and we're going to come back to it again and again and again. What was that promise in Genesis 3, 15? God promised this, the serpent, to the serpent as he cursed him, I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What happens here in Daniel, what happens here in Revelation, what happens everywhere is a result of that conflict, enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
Well, God didn't put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed and the seed of the serpent with a secret hope that just maybe the seed of the woman would win out. God wasn't confused or powerless here. He didn't bring down this curse, not knowing what the outcome would be. No, this was intentional. He was sovereign over his grand plan of salvation that would give him the magnificent king over all things, the most glory. And now in our text in Revelation 12, this same angel, Michael, who helped out in Daniel's day, Daniel 10, verse 13, he says that this mysterious figure was here, was held up by the prince of Persia for 21 days. He went on to fight a battle there. But there was an even greater battle that Michael would find himself taken in as he looked at it. The battle that we find in our text, Revelation 12. What is it? What is it that we see in Revelation 12? What is this great battle that takes place right here before our very eyes? Well, first, we have the, a character, a woman, that we read in verse 1 that she was a woman with a crown of 12 stars. In verse 2, we read that she was pregnant and crying out with the birth pains and the agony of giving birth. What is this referring to? Who is this woman? Well, what do you think? A woman crying out in the birth of child pain, 12 stars upon her head? Who might that be? Beloved, it's true Israel, the true church, bringing forth the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes from the seed of the woman, this Lord Jesus. He comes from the people of Israel. Again, 12 stars upon her head, 12 tribes. And she's giving birth. Her, her labor pains are increasing. And in swoops this dragon with seven horns, seven heads, seven crowns upon those heads. He's nasty. With one swoop of his tail, He takes out a third, we read, of the stars of heavens, verse 4. Satan, the one who accuses God's people all day long, who took legions of angels out of heaven with him when he was cast down after his rebellion. And now he sits and watches the seed of the woman as Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem. And the end of verse 4 tells us that he sits on his haunches just waiting to, read it, devour that child. Verse 5, the male child is born, but not any ordinary male child is this. No, he is, quote, the one who is to rule all the nations with an iron rod, and he is caught up to the throne of God. What did the Lord Jesus say in his ministry upon this earth? I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of my Father in in heaven. What did God the Father say at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ as that Spirit descended upon him? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But as a baby, the accuser, Satan, the devil, makes sure that there's no room in the inn. No safe place for God's son to be born. He makes sure that Herod is afraid of losing his crown. He he uses Herod's greed and fear to try to get rid of and extinguish this child who was born. Many little baby boys were killed because of Herod's thirst and lust for power. In verse 6, we read of the woman fleeing into the wilderness. Again, think of Mary and Joseph fleeing to Egypt. Just as God had planned, this wasn't a mistake. This wasn't random. This was God's plan coming into action. It was spiritual warfare. More wilderness. The tempting of the Lord Jesus in the wilderness. 
the, the devil causing every single soul on the face of the earth, including those who were closest to the Christ, to either flee him or to deny him in his darkest hour. The dragon sits and snorts before our Savior, hoping, waiting to devour him, causing his own people to sit, bit upon him, to mock him, calling for a Roman scourging upon his back. Maybe, just maybe, this one will be broken. Calling for Roman nails to be driven through his hands and feet, a crown of thorns shoved upon his head, to the point where our Lord Jesus bowed his head and said, It is finished. And he gave up his spirit. The dragon grins with glee. Oh, yes, it is finished, he thinks. Beloved spiritual warfare was here at its climax. All out war has broken out in heaven. Again, verses 7 and 8, look at our text with me. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Michael, the angel, has been fighting along with hosts of angels. But here in this moment, only the king wields the sword. Satan thought that Christ was finished off at the cross. But beloved, the good news for you and for me is that his atoning work was done. It was finished. It was Satan who was finished off at the cross. And so we hear these glorious dec declarations in verses 9 and 10. Look at 9 and 10 with me. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Beloved, our suffering in this world can be pretty terrible. In fact, as we heard earlier this day alone, people in our own church and in our broader community are undergoing intense suffering. We've been informed of some pretty scary health crises in our community. And so how can we even begin to cope with these if we don't have the joy, the hope, the promise that those declarations on verses 9 and 10 bring with them? You and I don't confess the words of question and answer 32 that I strive with the free conscience against sin and the devil in this life and afterwards to reign with him unless we have heard the final words of question and answer 31, that we have our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards and keeps us in the deliverance he won for us. Why strive against sin? Why have any hope at all when terrible things happen to us? Well, if the battle is up to us, it's worthless. What are we left with when Satan comes whispering those terrible accusations in our ear? Beloved, we can face all of these with rejoicing because he has no standing in heaven. He was cast out. He desires to accuse us, to tell the Lord, this one's worthless, another rebel. But when Christ said it was finished, it was finished. He has no authority. He's cast out. The battle is over. And yet there are many skirmishes that rage on around us. And so we can face all these things. We can face the running against those temptations and that same sin that keeps on coming up. 
Why? Because of that male child we read of who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. He has conquered. He is victorious. He now reigns over all. We're not just slogging through. We're not just barely getting by. We're not just waiting, hoping that one day Jesus will be king. Beloved, he reigns now. Oh, yes. We're waiting for that reign to be seen in its fullness. We're waiting for that glorious day to come. If you would, flip with me to Revelation 21 as we conclude this afternoon. The second to last chapter in the scriptures. As I said before, God's reign, his realm is much more than just this earth. It's heaven and earth. And look what happens when Christ comes again. Heaven and earth, one. The dwelling place of God is with men. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. John sees this as revealed to him by the Christ. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. You see, congregation, we only see part of the picture now. There will be a day when heaven and earth are one. No separation. There will be a day when God will dwell with us face to face. What we do here on the Lord's Day, coming together to worship, to commune with each other, to sing praises to our God, to hear his word, that will be full all the time on that day. Hearing the voice of God from his mouth to our face. Living and dwelling with each other without sin affecting our relationships without sin affecting the way we relate to our Lord, then we will reign and rule with him forevermore. But even now today, he is reigning and we are still striving. We're still contending with the devil and all his antics and all the antics of his wicked minions. But those days are numbered. They are coming to an end. Beloved, rejoice to see the accuser cast down even as he thrashes about. Soon he will be no more. Cling to your Savior. Strive with him. He is the only one who gives us glorious victory and rest. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord, indeed, many days it seems to us as if Satan is more powerful than he really is. There are some days where it seems to us that your victory is less than it is. But, O Lord, we know that Christ has crushed the head of the serpent, and now he strikes the heel, but, Lord, his days will come to an end soon. In the scheme of all eternity, whatever time he has left, O Lord, will be just a speck. And so as we encounter our own trials and our own heartaches, O Lord, let us put them into into perspective. Indeed, let us cry our tears. Let us mourn, O Lord. But let us not as mourn as those who have no hope. Let us mourn as victors, knowing that our King has conquered, knowing that he reigns over all things now, that our King, just as he was sovereign over the, the sojourning of, of Jacob and, and of Abraham, just as he was sovereign over the reign of David, over the word of the prophets, even over the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he now, too, is bringing us all the way home. He now is bringing, you now are bringing us to our eternal rest. 
the rest that we can even taste and see now that we can experience as your people. Oh, Lord, instill in us great hope, great strength, and great boldness. We ask this all in Jesus' holy and precious name, our Lord, our Master, and our King. Amen. In response, we'll turn to number 72A, a versification of Psalm 72. We'll sing 72A, standing to sing if you're able. Stanzas 1 through 4. 72A, 1 through 4.
Once again, our offerings are for the work of Grace Reform by way of our budget, as well as for the Calgary Youth Summit. Let's give together with cheerful hearts. We'll stand to sing our doxology, the final stanza of 72A. We'll sing stanza 8 of 72A. Beloved, go from this place and enter into a new week with the blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>